Most light aircraft use a direct current, or DC, supply to drive the electrical services. The term direct current implies that the electrons which make up the flow of current are travelling in one direction only. Convention states that the electrons flow from a positive source to a negative. Alternating current, on the other hand, has the electrons in the circuit moving backwards and forwards about a mean point. The number of electrons flowing past any one point in a conductor is measured in amperes, or amps for short, on an ammeter. Imagine the current of electrons flowing through a wire as being the same as water flowing in a pipeline. This is called the water analogy, and for people not too well acquainted with electricity, the water analogy can come in very handy in almost all situations when dealing with simple direct current circuits. So, as with any simple plumbing system, for the water to flow through the pipe requires that we have a pressure. This pressure is usually obtained from a water tank, which is placed above the level of the whole water system, and thus gravity helps us out. In an electrical circuit, the pressure required to move electrons along a wire is termed the electromotive force, or the voltage, which is measured in volts on a voltmeter. We can obtain this electromotive force, or voltage, from any of several sources. In a light aircraft, the main source of supply is the generator, or alternator, and the battery serves as a backup in case of alternator failure. The battery can run the aircraft's essential services for about 30 minutes. The battery also supplies power for engine starting. Resistance is the obstruction in a circuit which opposes current flow. Using the water analogy, you could imagine that a kink in a hose pipe would restrict the water flow. Likewise, a resistor placed in a circuit would lower the current flowing in that circuit. The supply is fed to the electrical components of the system via buzz bars, which are merely collection and distribution points. The buzz bars are usually solid copper bars which are drilled and tapped so that supply and distribution cables can be attached to them. Most light aircraft which utilise metal construction are single pole or earth return electrical systems. This means that the individual components are supplied via the buzz bars and cables, and to complete the circuit, the return current flows back through the metal of the airframe. Aircraft which are made of non-conductive materials require a double pole or two-wire system. This means that as well as having a cable taking the current flow to each individual component, another cable is required to complete the electrical circuit back to the negative side of the generator or alternator. This is probably a good time to explain the use of the two terms alternator and generator. Simply put, a generator produces direct current while an alternator produces alternating current internally, using a diode rectifier to turn the alternating current into direct current, which is then fed to the aircraft circuit. Alternators are used much more in all applications where a dependable power supply is required. Whereas a generator will probably require the engine to run at approximately half speed before it will deliver its full output, an alternator will give almost full power at engine idling speed. A battery is made up of a number of cells which convert chemical energy into electrical energy by a transfer of electrons from one material to another. There are two types of cell, the primary and the secondary. The primary cell is the type normally used in handheld equipment, like torches and transistor radios, etc. It consists of two electrodes immersed in a chemical called an electrolyte. The electrolyte encourages electron transfer between the electrodes until the electron imbalance between them exists as a potential difference or voltage. A voltage of approximately 1.5 exists between the electrodes of a new primary cell. For convenience, one of the electrodes is used as the container for the electrolyte, and the other electrode is placed within it, as shown here. When the two electrodes, now called the positive and the negative, are connected to an external circuit, electrons flow through the circuit. This external transfer of electrons is matched by an internal transfer from the positive to the negative electrode. As this circulation of electrons continues, a negative electron slowly dissolves into the electrolyte until it is eventually eaten away. At this point, the cell is dead. 
Once discharged, primary cells cannot be recharged. Secondary cells work on the same principle as primary cells, but the chemical energy in the cell can be restored when the cell has been discharged by passing a charging current through the cell in the reverse direction to that of the discharge current. In this way, the secondary cell can be charged and discharged many times over a long period of time. During charging, electrical energy is converted into chemical energy which is retained within the battery until it is once again discharged. The lead-acid battery is most commonly used in light aircraft. The electrodes in a lead-acid battery are called the plates. There is a positive plate, which is made of lead peroxide, and a negative plate, which is made of spongy lead. Both of the plates are immersed in an electrolyte of dilute sulfuric acid. The state of charge of a lead-acid cell can be determined by measuring the specific gravity of the electrolyte solution with a hydrometer. The electrolyte of a fully charged cell will have a specific gravity of approximately 1.3, whereas the electrolyte of a discharged cell will have a much more dilute acid, with a specific gravity somewhere in the region of 1.17. The voltage of a lead-acid battery cell when it's off-load, or not passing current, is 2.2 volts. Apply a load to the terminals of the cell, and the output voltage will fall to just 2 volts. The capacity of a cell is a measure of how much current it can provide over a certain period of time. The capacity of a cell is determined by the area of the electrodes, or plates as they are called in a secondary cell. Capacity is measured in ampere hours. A cell with a capacity of 80 ampere hours should provide a current of 8 amperes for 10 hours, or alternatively 80 amperes for 1 hour. However, because the ability of a battery to retain its output voltage diminishes as the discharge rate increases, capacity is normally tested at the 10-hour rate. It's not normal to use cells in isolation in aircraft batteries. Usually they are placed in series or in parallel with others of the same voltage and capacity. This cutaway diagram shows six cells in series with each other. This circuit diagram shows cells connected in series. Notice how the voltage of the circuit increases as more cells are added. Note also, however, that the capacity of the system remains the same as the capacity of one cell. This diagram shows cells joined together in parallel. Now the output voltage of the circuit is that of just one cell, but notice that the total capacity is the sum of the individual cell capacities. To charge a battery, it must be connected to an electrical supply which has a slightly higher voltage than that of the battery itself. When the battery is being charged, great care must be taken regarding the rate of charge. If the rate of charge is too high, then gassing will take place. Gassing is the formation of hydrogen gas on the plates. The gas must be allowed time to escape through the vent cap of the battery. If too much gas is produced in too short a time, then there's a danger that a build-up of gas pressure could cause the battery to explode, with the subsequent release of the sulfuric acid within. Under normal circumstances, the output voltage of the alternator or generator charging a 12-volt battery on an aircraft would be maintained constant at 14 volts, whereas the alternator of an aircraft with a 24-volt system would be maintained constant at 28 volts. After starting an engine using the aircraft battery, the generator or alternator is used to recharge it. The fact that the battery is being recharged is indicated on the system ammeter as a high load. Initially this will be quite high, but should quickly reduce as the battery is recharged. A word of caution here. If the load increases or remains high, then this could be an indication of a faulty battery. Remember, 
a high charge rate could result in a battery overheating and suffering damage. Voltmeters have a high internal resistance. They're connected in parallel with the circuit to measure the voltage between two points. Our meters have a low internal resistance and are placed in series with the circuit to measure the current through the load. Two types are used in light aircraft. The first has the zero position on the dial over to the left. It indicates the actual load on the alternator. Because of this, it's commonly called a load meter. The other type has the zero position in the center of the dial, and its needle indicates the current flow into and out of the battery. Abnormal conditions may arise in an electrical circuit for a variety of reasons. For instance, a breakdown of the insulation on one of the cables carrying the supply to a component will cause a dramatic rise in the current flowing in that cable if it comes into contact with the metal of the airframe. There are several serious problems inherent in this situation. Firstly, and probably least serious, is the fact that the component being fed by this particular cable will cease to operate. Secondly, if the circuit was not protected, the current which would flow through this short circuit for that's what this malfunction is called, would be so great that it could cause the power generation circuit, the alternator or generator and the battery, to fail. This would leave the aircraft without electrical power. Thirdly, and potentially the most serious, there is the risk of fire. At the point where the unprotected cable contacts the airframe metal, there will undoubtedly be sparks, which will ignite anything in the vicinity, and the cable itself will get so hot that more insulation will be melted from the cable, making the situation worse. Although there are a number of protection devices used in aircraft electrical systems, we'll look at only two of them. These are fuses and circuit breakers. The fundamental difference between fuses and circuit breakers is the time it takes for each of them to operate from the moment of maximum fault current flowing in the circuit. A fuse normally breaks the circuit before full fault current is reached, whereas the circuit breaker operates to break the circuit after full fault current is reached. The circuit breaker can also function in certain circumstances as a switch, opening and closing a circuit as required. The most common type of fuse in use on light aircraft is the cartridge fuse. It consists of a tubular, glass or ceramic body with the fuse element running through the centre connected to two brass end caps. The fuse operates, or blows, when the current flowing through is sufficient to melt the fuse element. The time this takes varies inversely with the current. All fuses are rated at a specific current value, that current being the current the element will carry continuously without unduly heating up or deteriorating. The rating of a fuse in a particular circuit is such that it is not less than the normal current flowing in that circuit, but will blow at a current level below the safety limit of the equipment or cable used. For this reason, only the specified fuse rating should be used in a particular circuit. A fuse that has blown may be replaced with another of the correct rating, but only once. If the replacement fuse blows when the circuit is reactivated, then there is obviously a defect in the system, and the fuse must not be changed again until the circuit has been investigated. Fuses which have a greater rating than that specified for a particular circuit must never be used. The consequences will most probably include greater damage being caused and may be an electrical fire. Circuit breakers are fitted, as are fuses, to protect equipment from overload or fault conditions. They incorporate a heat-sensitive tripping device and a manually operated trip reset switch. The type of circuit breaker shown in the diagram can be rated from between 5 to 45 amperes. The push-pull button is shown in the operated position. The white marker band is specifically there to draw attention to the fact that the circuit breaker has blown. A circuit breaker which is operated, or popped, may be reset just once. Do not be tempted to reset it a second time. If it's popped twice, then you may be sure that an electrical fault is present, and resetting the circuit breaker twice will only exacerbate it. This diagram shows a simplified alternator control circuit. 
For the purpose of this lesson, we'll assume that our aircraft is fitted with an alternator. From the point of view of the pilot, generator and alternator control circuits are very similar. The only difference worth noting is the rectifier shown here. This changes the alternating current output of the alternator to direct current, a procedure which is unnecessary with the generator because its output is direct current. At the top of the diagram you can see the buzz bar, which we previously said was a distribution point for the output of the alternator or generator. To the left is the field circuit, and to the right is the power circuit. The field circuit carries a relatively small current. The current flows through the field windings and is used to generate a magnetic field inside which the armature of the alternator rotates. The field circuit of this alternator is protected by a 5 amp circuit breaker. Just below that on the diagram is the alternator master switch, which you can see in the photograph is on the left of the row of switches. Immediately adjacent to the alternator master switch is the battery master switch. These two switches are usually mechanically interlocked so that the alternator cannot be operated without the battery. If either the field circuit breaker or the alternator master switch is opened, then the alternator field becomes inoperative and the alternator will not produce any output. Also in the field circuit is the over volts relay. A relay is just an electrically operated switch. This relay will operate to open the field circuit if the alternator output voltage rises above 16.5 volts. The effect will be the same as if the field circuit breaker or alternator master switch had been opened. The alternator will not produce any output. In this particular aircraft type, the over voltage relay can be reset by switching off the alternator master switch for about two seconds and then switching it back on again. Adjacent to the alternator is the voltage regulator. As its name implies, it controls the voltage output of the alternator in this case are between 14.5 to 16 volts. Power circuit passes the whole of the output of the alternator to the buzz bar, where it's then distributed to the individual components in the aircraft. The rectifier is necessary, as we said earlier, to convert the alternating current output of the alternator to direct current. The load meter measures the total current flowing from the alternator to the buzz bar. This illustration shows a simplified electrical wiring diagram of a typical light aircraft. Notice that in this aircraft all of the loads but two are protected by circuit breakers of varying amperage. The exceptions are the power side of the starting circuit and the battery. Although the power side of the starter motor circuit is not protected, the control part of that circuit is. Note that the starter switch gets its supply from the buzz bar via a 15 amp circuit breaker. A starter motor will take considerably more than 15 amps when it's first selected upon engine start. In fact, the initial load on the battery will exceed this figure by more than a factor of four. That sort of current flow would cause a circuit breaker to pop open in an instant, and if it was flowing through the starter switch, it would either melt its contacts or weld them together neither prospect being particularly appealing. To prevent either of these occurrences, the starting current is taken from the battery and passed through a starter relay. The starter relay is remotely controlled by the starter switch. When the starter switch is selected, it sends a supply to energize the coil of the starter relay. The starter relay has large contacts which are capable of easily passing the very high current required by the starter motor. So the starter motor rotates the engine. Try pressing the starter switch now and note how the supply is passed through the starter relay. Once the engine has started, the current that has been drained from the battery must be replaced by the alternator. 
We've already stated that initially this current flow, which is shown on the load meter, will be quite high. But we also stated that it should quickly reduce as the battery becomes recharged. If no loads at all are selected, then the only current flowing through the load meter will be the battery charging current. Even when the battery is fully recharged, residual charging current will still be about 2 amps. For night flying, for instance, add this 2 amps charging current to the other loads placed on the alternator and a reading of approximately 32 amps would be representative. If, on the other hand, the load meter reading ever drops to zero in flight, then this probably indicates that the alternator has failed. This occurrence will be covered in much greater detail later on in this lesson. So far we've only shown the load meter, which has a zero position on the left side of the dial. Another type of ammeter has the zero in the center of the dial, as shown here, and is referred to as a center zero ammeter. Notice that the center zero ammeter is differently situated in the circuit from the load meter. Whereas the load meter was capable of reading the whole of the output of the alternator, the center zero ammeter reads the current flowing into and out of the battery. Prior to engine start, with perhaps the navigation lights, the radio, instrument panel lights and the electrical fuel pump selected on, the center zero ammeter will show by the fact that the needle is indicating in the negative portion of the dial that the battery is discharging. Just after start, when the battery is some way to having recovered its charge, the center zero ammeter needle will indicate in the positive portion of the dial. This tells us that the alternator is capable of supplying all of the loads and the battery charging current. If, on the other hand, with the engine running, the center zero ammeter needle is well into the negative portion of the dial, it shows us that the alternator is incapable of supplying demand and that the battery is discharging. In this situation, it would be wise to start shedding loads. In other words, start switching off those services which are unnecessary until the ammeter needle once again indicates in the positive portion of the dial. This will then indicate that there is a flow of charge current into the battery. Most malfunctions of the aircraft electrical system will be indicated to the pilot by either the illumination of warning lights or by the readings on the load meter or center zero ammeter. If the aircraft has an annunciator system, then it's likely that this includes an alternator failure warning light. A test button will be incorporated into the annunciator system to check the light bulb filaments. The ammeter readings have already been covered but it may help to cover them once more from the point of view of the indications of malfunctions. First, we'll talk about the type of ammeter which has the zero on the left side of the dial, the load meter. This will indicate alternator failure by the needle going to zero. If the load meter reading appears high after the time the battery would normally have recharged itself subsequent to engine start, this may indicate that the battery has an excessive charging rate. An excessive charge rate will cause the battery to start losing some of the active material off its plates. This will cause serious and lasting damage to the battery. The high charge will also cause the battery to get very hot, possibly so much so that the electrolyte will evaporate, exposing the plates to the air, which once again will cause them damage. Bear in mind that the high charge rate could perhaps be brought about by a faulty voltage regulator. If this is the case, then all of the aircraft equipment will be at risk of becoming overheated and impaired, especially heat-sensitive components like the radio and navigation equipment. The center zero ammeter will indicate alternator failure by the needle showing a constant heavy discharge. If the needle stays just in the negative portion of the dial for any length of time, then this is characteristic of the situation where the alternator is incapable of supplying all the loads of the battery at the same time. This will require that some of the loads are switched off. In other words, some judicious load shedding must be done. Otherwise, the battery will eventually be completely discharged. The following drills are not to be considered as being representative of emergency drills for any particular aircraft type. They are purely general recommendations of the type of action 
which should be considered if an alternator should fail. In the event of either the load meter showing zero, or alternatively the center zero ammeter indicating a heavy discharge, and or the alternator failure warning light being on, the following actions should be considered. Initially, load shed. That is, judiciously select off any electrical, radio and navigation services not vital to the safe operation of the aircraft. If the alternator failure warning light is not illuminated, then use the press to test facility to check its filament. Next, check the field circuit breaker to see if it has tripped. If it looks normal, consider tripping and resetting it anyway. If your aircraft system has over voltage protection and the circuit breaker has not tripped, these indications may be evidence that the over voltage relay has tripped. Switch off the alternator master switch and leave it off for about two seconds. Try that now. Switch the master switch back on again. Now check the load meter or, or alternatively the center zero ammeter and also the alternator failure warning light. If the indications are that the alternator output has been restored, then restore the services singly in order of their importance to the safe operation of the aircraft. Do this relatively slowly and deliberately. Allow sufficient time between each service selection for the load to be taken up by the alternator. Should the alternator fail again, then the drill should be repeated, but this time do not select the faulty service. If your attempt at restoring the alternator is unsuccessful, then it would be advisable to reduce the electrical load as much as possible and land as soon as possible. Remember, any radio transmissions you make will seriously reduce the amount of charge left in the battery.